So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies Service Through Policy Research In need of references for your research? Do you want a digital library that you can access for free anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. Serpti is here for you. Serpti is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information, created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SERP, just visit the PIDS website and click the SERP widget, or type serp pidsgovph SERP has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers, policy notes, audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2021, SERPI has more than 50 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. SERPI provides a comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes, labor and education, gender and development, poverty, technology and innovation, trade and industry, and many more. You can search by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published. SERPI has more than 7,000 publications and audiovisual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit SERPI now! Socioeconomic Research Portal for the Philippines, Innovating Knowledge Exchange and Policy Research. Dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahing problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon. We should have a specific goals, um, do research, and make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. Iayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ang batas, pag-aralan muna gusto ng government. Two things, clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication, and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies, o PIDS, na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga pulisiya at programa ng pamalaan at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga pulisiyang makakatulong sa ating bansa. 
sinusulong ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policy making upang bigyan din ng kalaghan ng polisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. Napakalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag polisiya ay pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan! So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies Service Through Policy Research References for your research? Do you want a digital library that you can access for free anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. Serpy is here for you. Serpy is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SERP, just visit the PIDS website and click the SERP widget or type serp-p.pids.gov.ph. SERP has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers, policy notes, audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2021, SERPI has more than 50 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. SERPI provides a comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes, labor and education, gender and development, poverty, technology and innovation, trade and industry, and many more. You can search by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published. Therapy has more than 7,000 publications and audiovisual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit Therapy now. Socioeconomic Research Portal for the Philippines, Innovating Knowledge Exchange and Policy Research. Dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahin problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon. We should have a specific goals, um, do research, and make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. Iayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ang batas, pag-aralan muna gusto ng government. Two things. 
clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies o PIDS na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga pulisiya at programa ng pamalaan at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga pulisiya ang makakatulong sa ating bansa. Sinusulong ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policymaking upang bigyan din ang kalaghan ng pulisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. Napakahalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag pulisiya ay pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan! Welcome to the PIDS webinar series. Before we start the webinar, we would like to give you a few reminders. For attendees, your microphone is muted upon entry. In case you have a question, the moderator will read it during the open forum. For those attending via Cisco WebEx, use the chat box located at the lower part of the screen. Click the chat icon, type your name and affiliation, and your question, and send to all panelists. You may send your questions while the presentation is in progress. The moderator will read them during the open forum. For Facebook viewers, at least two questions from the comment section will be read by the moderator during the open forum. We will moderate all questions to ensure that they are relevant to the scope of the presentation. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to your active participation. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the PIDS webinar series, where we tackle development issues based on data and evidence. I'm Sheila CR, and I will be your moderator. In today's webinar, we will talk about the Philippines' performance in achieving the targets of the ASEAN Economic Community Vision 2025, five years after the AEC blueprint was adopted by the ASEAN member states. We'll also find out how we fared compared to our ASEAN neighbors. At the same time, We'll hear some updates on the implementation of the blueprint across the member states. To officially open our virtual event, I now give the floor to our president at PIDS, Dr. Aniceto Arbeta Jr. Uh, before we begin, uh, let me, I'd like to acknowledge the, the presence of the following. 
uh, from their government. We have Department of Interior and Local Government Assistant Secretary Esther Aldana, Tariff Commission Commissioner Marisa Maricusa Panderon, and Director Maria Lourdes Saluta, Assistant Ombudsman Pilarita Lapitan, House of Representatives Congressional Policy and Budget Research Department Director uh, General uh, Romulo Miral Jr. and Director Elsie Gutierrez, Cabinet Secretariat of the Philippines Director Mary Christine Joy Paras, National Economic and Development Authority UIC Director Joseph Lalob, Department of Foreign Affairs uh, Director Ivan Frank Ulia, Director Sheila Marie Tario, and Assistant Director Bien Janine Balukating, Department of Trade and Industry Assistant Director Bianca Sikimti, and Department of Science and Technology Philippine Council for Industry, Energy, and Emerging Technology Research and Development, Deputy Director, Executive Director, Nanalisa Escorial, a Securities and Exchange Commission Assistant Director, Violita Infante, Banco Central ng Pilipinas, Managing Director, Thomas Benjamin Marcelo, Deputy Director, Christina Garido Ho, and Deputy Director, Christine Tan. Uh, Government Commission for Geosis Acting Director Catherine Lusuriaga, Commission on Population and Development Caraga Regional Director Alex uh, Alexander uh, Makinano, and Mindanao Development Authority uh, Under Secretary Janet Lupos and Assistant Secretary Romeo Montenegro. From the private sector, we have Kathailan Incorporated Chief Executive Officer Jeffrey Nang. Center for Research and Communications President Daniel Reyes, Beauty Profile Corporation President George C, Bank of the Philippine Islands Vice President Christine Lovely Red, Shumak My uh, Realty Corporation Chief Financial Officer Mark Andrew Malbas, Billiar CPAC Director uh, Raina Rai G uh, Tamana. From the academy, let me acknowledge the following. University of San Carlos President Narciso Silian, Marinduque State College President Justado Soluita, uh, Siliman University Vice President for Development Jane Anit Bellarmino and Vice President for Finance and Administration Jenny Chu, Western Mindanao State University Dean Raul Alburu and Dean Mario Ritze Hibunada, Central Luzon State uh, University Dean Matilde Milicenta Santos Recto, and directors of various universities and colleges who are here with us today. From the CSOs, NGOs, and INGOs, we have uh, International Labor Organization Director Khalid Hassan, uh, Asian Development Bank Director Abdul Abdiad, and consultant uh, Eduardo Dulay, uh, Small Enterprise uh, Research and Development Foundation Trustee Tony Galinos, DEEP Scholars Associations Incorporated Managing Trustee Brillio Rainis, Philippine Exporters Confederation Incorporated on Ferry Export Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer Sinin Peral, per, Perlada and Vice Pres, President Maria Florderisa Leong, uh, Federation of Filipino Chinese Chambers of Commerce Incorporated Vice President Victor Lim, uh, Institute for Development of Education, Educational and Ecological Alternatives Executive Director Roger Karinga, Lorma uh, Community Development Foundation Incorporated Executive Director Andrew Cesar Rimando, and Philippine Center for Islam and Democracy Programs Director Salmar Pier Rasul, Masaganang Sakan Inc Incorporated Director Daniel Agustin, and Bankers Association of the Philippines Associate Director Arnil Almaden. Let me also greet our friends from the media. And finally, let me also greet our guests colleagues from government, uh, academic, civil society, media, private sector, as well as those who are watching to the PIDS and SERPI Facebook pages. Good afternoon and welcome to our last webinar for this month. In November 2015, the Association of Southeast Asia Na Nation or ASEAN member countries uh, established the ASEAN community composed of three pillars, the ASEAN economic community, the ASEAN sociocultural community, and the ASEAN political security community. 
These three pillars have their own blueprints, which are integrated into a general master plan called ASEAN Community Vision 2025. While the three pillars have, are equally significant, we give particular uh, importance to the ASEAN Economic Community, or AEC, given its role in today's economy. ASEAN is the, third, as the world's third largest market. It has 667 million people and the third largest labor force next to China and India. These figures uh, show how beneficial it is to meet the AEC vision, which is a single market and production base characterized by free flow of goods as services and investment, investments, as well as free flow of capital and skills. Featured in this webinar is the PID study, uh, how does the Philippine fare uh, in meeting ASEAN Economic Community Vision 2025, authored by PIDS Senior Fellow uh, Francis Mark Kimba, former PIDS Supervising Research Specialist Maureen Ann Osilon, Osilon and uh, Philippine Apex Study Center uh, Network Project Evaluation Officer Jean, Carlos, uh, Jean Clarice T. Carlos. This study focuses on the AEC Blueprint 2025, particularly its characteristics in elements. Each characteristic is composed of elements uh, or key result areas that include specific strategies to achieve goals of the Blueprint. Dr. Kimba will share their assessment of how the Philippines has fared in achieving the key result areas uh, found in the Blueprint compared to the other ASEAN countries. He will also provide the study's recommendations on which areas need improvement and what strategies should be done to address related challenges. To further the, understand the country's performance, we invited representatives from concerned agencies. We have Indust uh, Industry Development and Trade Policy Group Assistant Secretary Attorney Alan Gypti of the Department of Trade and Industry, Chair of the Committee of the AEC and represents the Philippines to the ASEAN High Level Task Force on Economic Integration and Assistant Director Glenda Reyes of the Monitoring, Surveillance and Coordination Division of the ASEAN Integra Integration Monitoring Directorate. Thank you very much, Assistant Secretary Gypti and Assistant Director Reyes for accepting our invitation. I look forward to our fruitful discussion this afternoon. Thank you and good afternoon. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Urbeta. So um, we also acknowledge the presence of Dr. Salito Habito, who's uh, watching the live stream of um, this event on our Facebook page. Thank you, sir, for um, attending. OK, so uh, before we begin, um, allow me to uh, remind you about our house rules for those who are joining us the first time or who miss hearing the recording before we started the webinar. So to join the open forum, simply use the chat box uh, located at the lower part of the WebEx screen and just type your name and affiliation and uh, send it uh, to all panelists or to everyone and not to a particular person. Um, I will read your question during the open forum. And since we have limited time, please make your question uh, concise. Okay. And for our viewers on Facebook, you're also very much welcome to participate in the discussion. Just type your question in the comment section, and I will read up to two questions during the open forum. At this point, I now invite all of you to pay attention to our featured study for this webinar. As mentioned by Dr. Orbeta, it was uh, authored uh, by uh, Dr. Francis Kimba, Dr. Mo Ms. Maureen Ann Rosellon, and Ms. Jean Clarice T. Carlos. And uh, to present the study is Dr. Francis Kimba. A senior research fellow at PIDS and director of the uh, Philippine Apex Study Center Network. He has worked on a number of research topics, including trade, competition, um, competition and innovation. And his current uh, research interest is in innovation, is in um, is about the innovation activity of local firms and regional integration issues. And he has participated in roundtable discussions on issues of trade, industrial development, innovation, and e-commerce. He has two master's degrees one in international development from the international university of japan and in uh, development economics from the national graduate institute for policy studies in tokyo japan where he also got his phd dr kimba you now have the virtual floor thank you sheila um may i share my slides
So good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me clearly. And uh, so I am here to present our study, a joint study that uh, I, we worked on last year with uh, Maureen Rosellon and Jean uh, Carlos um, of PIDS, uh, well, back then PIDS. Essentially, I'm um, trying to answer this question. How does the Philippines fare in meeting the ASEAN Economic Community Vision 2025? The presentation will go as follows. Uh, an introduction of the study and what we want, want to answer. And then how did we go about uh, um, finding the, trying to answer our uh, question. And then um, there are a number of indicators in the AEC. Um, uh, there are a number of AEC indicators. So we'll just present a summary and I, I will point to everyone. I'll point everyone to the discussion paper for um, more details or for if you're interested for uh, learning about the the performance of the Philippines in all of the, the indicators. And then we want to see how the Philippines performance is aligned uh, in the AEC is aligned with our goals is in local goals, domestic goals in as uh, identifying the Philippine development plan. And finally, some conclusions and uh, recommendations. So the ASEAN Economic Community is one of the three pillars of the ASEAN Community. The ASEAN Community was formally established, as uh, we've mentioned, as we've heard earlier, November, in November of 2015, during the 27th ASEAN Summit uh, held in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. In the same summit, the ASEAN leaders pledged their continuous commitment to achieve regional prosperity and peace and adopted the ASEAN Community Vision 2025. It's a 10-year community building strategy composed of blueprints for each pillar of the ASEAN community, namely the ASEAN economic community, the ASEAN social cultural community, and the ASEAN political security community. The slide shows that the 2025 vision for each pillar, the AEC in particular, envisions a community that is highly integrated regionally and globally, competitive and innovative, and more connected, resilient, and inclusive by 2025. Each pillar has a blueprint comprising of characteristics of the envisioned community. While each characteristic is comprised of elements or key result areas with strategies to achieve the community goals. For the AEC blueprint, which is, focus, which is the focus of this study, there are five character, characteristics reflecting the vision a highly integrated and cohesive economy, a competitive, innovative, and dynamic ASEAN, enhanced connectivity and sectoral cooperation, resilient, inclusive, and people-oriented and centered ASEAN, and a global ASEAN. So let me try to go through each quickly. A highly integrated and cohesive economy in this characteristic aims to facilitate the seamless movement of goods, services, investment, capital, and skilled labor within ASEAN in order to enhance ASEAN's trade and production networks, as well as to establish a more unified market for its firms and consumers. The second one, a competitive, innovative, and dynamic ASEAN, this characteristic focuses on elements that contribute to increasing the region's competitiveness and productivity, including strengthening overall regulatory practice and coherence at the regional level. The third characteristic seeks to enhance economic connectivity in various sectors, namely transport, telecommunication, and energy, and to further integrate and cooperate in key sectors that complement existing efforts toward creating an integrated and sustainable economic region with strengthened soft and hard networks. The fourth one, a resilient, inclusive, people-oriented, and people-centered ASEAN, aims to enhance equitable economic development in the region, such as through the development of MSMEs, increasing participation of the private sector in community building, and ensuring shared benefits of integration to all sectors of the society and economy and to all countries in the region. Finally, a global ASEAN seeks to further integrate the AEC into the global economy through trade agreements that strengthen the ASEAN's position as an open and inclusive economic region and promote complementarities and mutual benefits for the region. And each of these characteristics 
is comprised of elements or key result areas with strategies to achieve the community goals. So for this study, we wish to track the Philippines' progress in achieving the characteristics and key result areas outlined in the AEC Blueprint 2025. Specifically, we wanted to rank the Philippines' performance vis-a-vis -vis its neighbors, to examine the Philippines' performance based on alignment between the AEC vision and the Philippine Development Plan, and to identify areas for improvement and provide policy recommendations to address bottlenecks. The study supports the also uh, raising awareness of Filipinos on ASEAN, including the Philippines' contribution to the AEC community building. The research by Albert et al. in 2017, uh, also by PIDS, suggested the need to increase awareness and understanding of what ASEAN is among Filipinos. And the findings, can, the findings of this study can also influence the plan of action of policymakers as well as private sector in addressing gaps in socioeconomic planning and policy implementation. So what did we do? So for this study, we used the indicators identified in the ASEAN Community Progress Monitoring System or the ACPMS report in 2017, particularly the AEC indicators as this is the focus of the study. The ACPMS is one of the efforts made by ASEAN to keep track and assess the regional integration process. And it is aimed to provide statistics on ASEAN integration outcomes. There were three ACPMS reports released. The most recent one was in 2017. And all the ACPMS reports presented indicators to assess the progress made by ASEAN member states in community building. The ACPMS 2017 report identified for each of the five pillar characteristics, three core indicators and various supporting indicators. Core indicators were intended to track the most essential elements of the AEC and supporting indicators were included to discuss elements or key result areas that are not accounted for by the core indicators. In our study, we updated the indicators in the ACPMS 2017 reports database, which uh, we used for which we used a number of sources, ASEAN Secretariat's database and yearbooks, World Bank's uh, database like WITS, uh, IMF, UNCTAD, and various sources. And, but the difficulty with the, this is that uh, some data points have varying starting points, now some up 2005, and then the end points are also um, different. So we will, um, the, the paper has discussed uh, those and um, presented those data. So some of them are 2019, some of them are uh, only available up to 2018, at the time that we're doing this study. So we also wanted to characterize the Philippine performance. So the study looked at the performance in terms of ranking vis-a-vis -vis ASEAN countries, and the indicators rankings were classified in top, middle, bottom, using the following criteria. So if the top, if you're uh, first to the third, middle, if you're fourth to the sixth, and bottom, if you're seventh to the tenth. The study also looks at the performance of the Philippines with respect to the AEC targets. So they are classified into on-track or off-track or static, using the following criteria. So on-track, if you're improving and your direction is towards the target or off track if you're if not um, moving towards the vision or the target or has no significant progress. So for example, increasing an intra-ASEAN exports and imports are on track as to the AEC goal of seamless flow of goods in the region, while a decline in the global competitive index score deviates from the AEC goals of strengthening competitiveness. So that would put you off track. Because the Philippine commitment to the ASEAN community is also expected to result in domestic improvements, this study highlights the Philippine context in relation to the goals outlined in the Philippine Development Plan 2017 to 2022. The study also looked at selected indicators of the Philippine Development Plan that are aligned with the AEC characteristics. So our source for the data on indicators is the statistical indicators on Philippine development of stat dev which is an instrument formulated and maintained by the PSA as a means by which economic progress and social change can be monitored and measured more effectively. So what did we find? So the next few slides actually presents the AEC characteristic, the AEC indicators based on the ACPMS reports, as well as the Philippine Development Plan and their indicators that are related to the AEC characteristics and elements. So for instance, we, we tried we did the mapping and we found that in characteristic one, a highly integrated and cohesive economy 
The AEC indicators include value and proportion of intra-ASEAN trade in goods and services, tariff on intra-ASEAN imports, financial and FDI-related indicators, etc. The characteristics aligned to the Philippine Development Plan pillars, namely inequality reducing transformation and enabling and supportive economic environment. Shown here as well are the Philippine Development Plan chapters and the Philippine Development Plan indicators, which suggest comparability to the AEC indicators. For instance, expanding economic opportunities in the agriculture, fisheries, and forestry, and in industry and services, and indicators related to exports, investments, and GVC participation. So in the interest of time, the, the, I will not talk about each and every indicator and our performance there, but I point you to the discussion paper later for further details. So second, the competitive, innovative, and dynamic ASEAN AEC indicators include labor productivity, R&D expenditures as percentage of GDP, global competitive index, and supporting indicators on trademark and patent, time required to start a business, and control of corruption index. The related PDP pillars are enhancing the social fabric, particularly the objective of ensuring a people-centered, clean and efficient governance and other related pillar is the inequality reducing transformation. There are several related PDP indicators as listed in this table. Um, and some of which are the same, actually the same as the AEC indicators, such as the control of corruption, the global competitive index, R&D expenditures as percent of GDP and others. On characteristic three, enhanced com connectivity and sectoral cooperation, AEC indicators include those related to intra and extra ASEAN tourist arrivals, fixed broadband and mobile network coverage, logistics indices, and indicators for other sectors such as energy, minerals, and e-commerce. The related PDP pillar is increasing growth potential and the specific goal of infrastructure development. PDP indicators include those related to air, passenger, and cargo traffic, the number of international flights, the number of water transport passengers, and others. On characteristic four, resilient, inclusive, and people-oriented and people-centered ASEAN, AEC indicators include the MSME uh, density, labor force participation rate, uh, private partnership investments, domestic credit to the private sector, and it is noted here that there are indicators that reflect, refer to the ASEAN collectively, such as the ratio between the average GDP per capita in ASEAN per CLMV and the ASEAN 6 uh, CLMV gap in the intra-ASEAN trade and inward FDI. So the Philippine performance could not be specifically determined for these types of indicators. But there are still some PDP pillars that are related. And this would include enabling and supportive economic environment and inequality redu reducing transformation, particularly the goals of expanding economic opportunities in industry and services and accelerating human capital development, which is chapter 10 of our PDP. PDP indicators include number of MSMEs participating in the global value chains and the percentage of youth not in education, employment, and training, or the NDET. Finally, the global ASEAN. AEC indicators include tariff rates on extra ASEAN imports and imports from ASEAN FTA partners, extra ASEAN trade and FDI flows from ASEAN to the rest of the world and from the rest of the world to ASEAN. Philippine Development Plan pillars related to this, to this characteristic include the foundations for sustainable development and enabling and supportive economic environment. Specific strategies, including promoting greater amity and cooperation with all nations, and expanding and enhancing diplomatic engagements and cooperation in regional and international fora, and enhancing technical cooperation and economic cooperation through participating in bilateral, regional, and global integration. There are no direct indicators in the StatDev, the PSA indicator database, but indirect indicators are merchandise and services exports. It is noted that there are, while there are several indicators used in the study, the indicators do not exhaustively and exactly represent the AEC characteristics as there are more AEC key result areas or elements that the ind indicators identified. 
and the availability of data is also part of the consideration. However, the use of the indicators is deemed a relevant approach as it provides a method that contributes to the review and analysis of the progress made in the AEC blueprint. There could be other methods to supplement such analysis, for instance, analysis of the official documents and policies and regulations, but these are not covered in this study and hence recommended for further research. So now let's just uh, look at a, uh, a condensed summary of uh, the Philippine performance for each of the characteristics. Characteristic one aims to eliminate barriers to the movement of goods, services, capital, and labor within ASEAN in pursuit of a more unified market for the region. And for most of the indicators, the Philippines overall ranked around the lower middle, or the highest is actually in the fourth. So we're actually around fourth um, in the, the middle group. So vis-a-vis -vis other ASEAN countries. But as far as uh, achieving the targets of the AEC Vision 2025, the country is experiencing upward trends, particularly in the areas of trade in goods and services, participation in global value chains, and financial inclusion. Some of the indicators where rank is high, where we are actually in the first to the third, include intra-ASEAN imports and services sector share in GDP. While indicators where in ranking of the Philippines is low, we belong to the 7th to 10th, include intra-ASEAN exports, intra-ASEAN FDI flows by source country, and accounts in a financial institution. As for characteristic two, little progress is seen in indicators such as R&D expenditure as percent of GDP, researchers per million people, control of corruption. But the ranking of the Philippines compared to other ASEAN is almost mostly in the middle. There are no high ranking indicators for the country in characteristic two, and bottom ranking was seen in R&D expenditure as percent of GDP and time required to start a business. Characteristic three aims for the integrated and sustainable key sectors through enhanced connectivity and strengthened hard and soft networks. Improvements were seen in indicators related to tourist arrivals, fixed broadband subscriptions, population covered by 3G, liner shipping connectivity index, and off-track or no progress in logistics performance index and 4G coverage in recent years. In terms of ranking, the country was in the middle or middle or the bottom middle on most key result areas under this characteristic. Indicators where in ranking of the Philippines is high include water transport passengers, percentage of renewable energy in primary energy supply, and indicators where in ranking of the Philippines is low include intra-ASEAN tourist arrivals, percent of 3G coverage, and others. Meanwhile, characteristic four aims for development and increased participation of MSMEs in economic activities increased participation of the private sector in community building, and narrowing of the development gap between less developed and developing economies or developed economies in the region, among others. The country showed improvement in indicators on private partner investments in infrastructure in sectors such as energy, transport, sanitation, but not in ICT, and sluggish performance in MSME density and youth labor force participation rate. In characteristic four, the country is mostly at the top or middle ranking vis-a-vis -vis other ASEAN countries. High rank was seen in the private partnership investments in transport and water and sanitation infrastructure, and low rank in MSME density and youth labor participation. Finally, uh, a global ASEAN. Aims, the, the characteristic aims for a globally integrated and open economic community strengthened through trade agreements. On one hand, the Philippines is increasing openness to the world through trade as barriers in the form of tariff rates are gradually being brought down in FTAs and MFN rates being one of the lowest in ASEAN. There is also increasing FDI from the rest of the world. However, there, is, there was a observed decreasing FDI flows to the rest of the world. The Philippine ranks one of the top in the reduced tariff rates on imports with FDA partners and with the rest of the world. But the country ranks one of the lowest in terms of the ratio of trade with the rest of the world to GDP. 
Okay, so this is that slide. So this table shows that the summary of the Philippines' performance in the indicators for each of the AEC characteristics based on the rankings vis-a-vis -vis the ASEAN countries. So the top, again, uh, to reiterate, top means ranking from first to third, middle if you're fourth to sixth, and bottom if you're seventh to tenth. And uh, again, these are assumptive rankings uh, based on the most recent year or data available when we collected the data last year. The data indicate that considering all indicators used in the study, the Philippines performed at the middle level compared to other ASEAN countries, specifically in 29 out of the 60 indicators. So um, most of us, most of our indicators are in the, the 29 uh, rank. So we're in the middle. In this slide, we show the performance in relation to the AEC vision or targets. With on track, as again, um, on track, we mean that performance in the indicators is improving and directed towards the AEC vision or target, and off track if not moving towards the vision or target or has no progress. And data indicates that the Philippines is on track in 37 out of the 60 indicators. So, um, doing relatively well. So just to summarize, the Philippines um, can leverage the AEZ to pursue the goals outlined in the Philippine Development Plan. As you can see, there's really a very uh, coherent mapping between the AEZ and the PDP. As the PDP 2017 to 2022 and AEZ have overlapping goals. We looked at the alignment in both blueprints and find similar trends in PDP accomplishments and performance in the AEC characteristics. The Philippine Development Plan goals related to the AEC characteristic one indicate generally like high likelihood of achieving targets, particularly in terms of trade and local and foreign investments. For those related to characteristic two, there's generally low likelihood of achieving targets, except in indicators related to SDI utilization, like Filipino patents, utility models, industry designs, which indicate moderate to high likelihood. Meanwhile, performance related to connectivity and sectoral cooperation indicate transport-related infrastructure show moderate to highly high likelihood of achieving the Philippine Development Plan target, and the PDP goals related to resilience and inclusiveness indicate on average moderate likelihood of achieving targets. We, we don't include characteristic five here because there are no uh, direct indicators. So given this, the Philippines is generally moving towards the AEC goals, but it is showing moderate performance in comparison with ASEAN countries, as well as in accomplishing uh, what we have set forth in the Philippine Development Plan goals. With aspirations of becoming an upper middle income country, more improvements would be needed to step up the progress being made. A number of domestic policies have been crafted that directly support the achievement of the AEC goals. There is a need to evaluate some of the policies to see how these could be strengthened to support our AEC commitments in addition to our national goals. Increasing trade is an indication of an open and globally integrated economy, but data indicate that the volume of trade can be improved. Our national industrial strategy, IQS, would need to keep supporting and pushing the industries to innovate and produce competently and, competently and sustainably. The data also indicate that the performance in connectivity is weak. There are national projects to improve connectivity infrastructure, but one area that also deserves priority is ICT. The Philippines is observed to have relatively high cost, but low speed and weak internet connection, and to still have areas that are offline. The COVID-19 pandemic highlighted the importance of internet connectivity and digitalization in addressing consequences of mobility restrictions. But overall, internet and digital connectivity promotes better public service delivery and industry competitiveness and growth. There would also be a need for, a more, for more participation to achieve goals of a more inclusive society and economy. In particular, encouraging startups and entrepreneurship, financial participation to the unserved and underserved, and job opportunities for the youth. The experience from the pandemic has shown that a number of the youth are innovative and enterprising. The country can capitalize on these characteristics to maximize the gains 
from the demographic dividend. Providing opportunities to do business online is a good opportunity. It's a good support program for the youth. Moreover, the country must aim for attracting more investments, especially in technology. Aside from the traditional sources, the country can also look to ASEAN as a source of investment and thus become more integrated with the region. An enabling environment for business, both domestic and foreign investments, is in the agenda of the government. An example would, is the enactment of the ease of doing business law. However, effective implementation at the grassroots level may need strengthening, and data indicate that the Philippines has one of the longest uh, periods required to open a business. In view of the pandemic, the ASEAN developed frameworks to support recovery in the region. Aside from these initiatives, updating of the targets and other strategies in AEC Vision 2025 may need to be need may be needed as expected outcomes may not be delivered in the originally planned timeline. And ASEAN member states would have redirected or reprioritized their respective national plans. For instance, the Philippine Development Plan was updated to focus on a healthy and more resilient Philippines as an immediate objective. Moreover, adding a mechanism that would prompt the ASEAN Secretariat and the ASEAN member states to review the relevant ASEAN goals and strategies during regional and global crises would also be recommended in case of high impact crisis and critical events should happen again in the future. On the domestic front, there is also a need to reevaluate re the Philippine plans and indicators to capture the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, which I think NEDA is already doing. NEDA is actively assessing the indicators of the Philippine Development Plan, and there's also a need for the entire government, including the local governments, to update their plans and incorporate some of the AEC targets. So let me now uh, mention that this is actually the, the discussion paper from which all of the the discussion is coming from and the, the indicators are also presented here in greater detail. So I um, recommend uh, this to everyone who would be interested. Uh, thank you very much and uh, I welcome your questions later in the open forum. And thank you very much, uh, Francis. Uh, we'll hear more from Francis during the open forum. So if you have questions regarding his presentation, we'll have uh, uh, more chance to unpack uh, the results of, of their assessment during the open forum. Thank you, Francis. Okay, so um, let's continue the conversation and this time we will hear from our invited experts, their insights on uh, the studies of uh, findings and recommendations. Our first discussant is from uh, the Department of Trade and Industry. We have Assistant Secretary Alan Gepti of the Industry Development and Trade Policy Group of the DTI. He and his team handle um, international trade policy and trade negotiations at the bilateral, regional, and multilateral levels. He is also the country's a senior economic official at the ASEAN and the Philippines lead negotiator in the RCEP. He was a former Deputy Director General at the in, of the in, Intellectual Property Office of the Philippines and um, Commissioner of the Philippine Tariff Commission. Asif Gepti is a lawyer with diverse experience in international trade, inter, uh, intellectual property, public international law, commercial law, and litigation. Although Asif, Asif Gepti cannot be with us today due to an equally important activity, he sent us a recording of his comments. So let us watch this. So uh, please just wait, okay. Good afternoon, everyone. First, I would like to thank the Philippine Institute for Development Studies for their active role and contribution in carrying out the study on the Philippines' implementation of the ABC Blueprint 2025. I would like to begin with what ASEAN means for the Philippines. ASEAN is a top trading partner of the Philippines, with exports amounting to 10.2 billion US dollars in 2020. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the region remained a key trading partner of the country, as the black comprised 23.54% of the country's total trade. As a region, ASEAN could not afford to embrace an inward policy, 
It has to expand regional integration and strengthen partnership with its trading partners. Thus, with the global economy still experiencing the negative effects of the pandemic, there is a need to further strengthen economic integration and collaboration with other trading partners. This approach will help mitigate the economic impact and disruptions to our people's health and livelihood and the economic activities in the region. By working together, ASEAN was able to further concretize the individual efforts of member states, ASEAN sectoral bodies and dialogue partners towards ensuring the smooth flow of essential goods, as well as minimizing disruptions in our supply chains. This cooperation was evident and instrumental in the development of the ASEAN Comprehensive Recovery Framework and the signing of the Memorandum of Understanding on the Implementation of Non-Tariff Measures on Essential Goods under the Hanoi Plan of Action on Strengthening ASEAN Economic Cooperation and Supply Chain Connectivity in response to the COVID-19 pandemic among others. ASEAN also provided an avenue for member states to discuss and recalibrate respective policies, especially on strengthening our supply chains in the new normal, to be more resilient to any similar situations and to promote complementarity in our regional supply chain connectivity. Now, what are the key accomplishments of the AEC that are important for the Philippines? The ASEAN Economic Community 2025 is an aspiration held by 10 ASEAN member states to be, by year 2025, a highly integrated and cohesive economy, a competitive, innovative, and dynamic ASEAN with enhanced connectivity and sectoral cooperation by remaining resilient, inclusive, people-oriented, and people-centered, and becoming a global ASEAN. In the establishment of a free trade area, ASEAN has been focusing on further facilitating trade in goods in the region. ASEAN has streamlined the origin certification and verification procedures for the granting of tariff preferences. It has simplified the paper-based and electronic certificates of origin, or Form D, and implemented the ASEAN-wide self-certification scheme. It has come on board of the live environment implementation of the ASEAN single window for the exchange of e D. In addition, ASEAN solutions for investment services and trade was also launched. This is an electronic platform for resolution of implementation issues raised by ASEAN-based businesses. ASEAN has also endorsed the guidelines for the implementation of ASEAN commitments on NTMs on goods which provides a framework on transparency and management of NTMs. In addition, ASEAN developed the NTM Cost Effectiveness Toolkit, which will provide a framework to review the cost effectiveness of existing NTMs of ASEAN member states. Recognizing the growing role of the services sector, ASEAN continues to further integrate and boost the competitiveness of the said sector through liberalization efforts such as the ASEAN Trade and Services Agreement. The ATISA will enhance and supersede the ASEAN Framework Agreement on Services signed in 1995 and facilitate the region's expanding services sector by providing a rules-based framework to increase supply chain roles, trade and investment clause, and reduce barriers, as well as promoting participation of micro, small, and medium enterprises. ASEAN also continues to facilitate trade and services through strengthening implementation of mutual recognition arrangements in professional services in sectors such as engineering, architecture, accountancy, survey, medical, dental, and nursing services. Outside of this, ASEAN continues to engage in other critical areas that impact rates such as intellectual property, competition policy, TBT, SPS, and many others. Efforts range from cooperation to the establishment of frameworks for mutual recognition. Altogether, these initiatives improve the investment environment in the region. These regional accomplishments complement the Philippines' goals under the PDP, which are, among others, to sustain a sound, stable, and supportive macroeconomic environment. We welcome the findings of PIDs, which highlights the areas where the country outperforms other member states and the areas where we, need, where we may need to work. Next is how has ASEAN helped us expand our trade relations? 
Under the ambit of ASEAN, the Philippines has expanded its trade relations through the seven FTAs signed with external partners, namely Australia and New Zealand, China, Japan, Korea, India, and Hong Kong, China. These arrangements expand the country's trade and investment relations beyond bilateral arrangements made with Japan and the European Free Trade Association. On November 15, 2020, the Philippines also signed the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement with the CN member states in Australia, China, Japan, Korea, and New Zealand. Considered as the world's largest trading bloc, the Philippines' participation in RCEP through ASEAN provides an opportunity to improve the country's trade balance, increase welfare, and lower poverty incidence as early as, early as its entry into force with significant improvements by 2030. Of course, ASEAN Plus One FTAs will nonetheless coexist with the RCEP agreement and will continue to be implemented despite the latter's entry into force on January 1, 2022. Now, what are the areas for improvement that ASEAN, particularly the Philippines, should focus on? We acknowledge the recommendation on the need to improve performance in the areas of competitiveness, innovation, and inclusive participation. Together with the inclusive innovative industrial strategy, which the authors mentioned, the DTI is implementing the following programs to support local industries and businesses innovate, be competitive, and participate into the global value chains. And they are one, shared services facilities, second, ease of doing business, third, doing business in free trade areas, fourth, Philippine Halal Export Development and Promotion Program. Fifth, Philippine Export Competitiveness Program. Sixth, the Regional Interactive Platform for Philippine Exporter Plus or Meeples. Another program is She Trades Philippines Hub and also Startup Filipinas. Alongside the programs mentioned above, pursued by the national government, there are several economic reforms that have been undertaken and currently being done. The Philippines has already passed the Republic Act Number no. 11534 or the Create Law, which took effect on April 11, 2021. Other pending amendments, such as the Public Service Act, Foreign Investment Act, Retail Trade Liberalization Act, and the Internet Transactions Act, are in the pipeline and once passed are expected to encourage more investments in the country. On FDI, according to UNCTAD report, FDI in the Philippines rose by 29% in 2020 to 6.4 billion US dollars, backing the decline of the Southeast Asian neighbors and of the world. The Philippines is among the very few countries which experienced an increase in FDI, such as China, Japan, India, Sweden, Spain, and Israel. For 2021, the Banco Central of Filipinas has reported that FDI net inflows grew by 139.5%, that is to $808 million in March 2021 from the $337 million net inflows recorded in the same month last year. The favorable performance in March brought a cumulative FDI net inflows to $2.4 billion in the first quarter of 2021 higher by 45.1% than the $1.6 billion net inflows recorded in the same period last year. The increase in FDI was mainly due to the 113.2% growth in non-residents net investment in debt instruments to $1.4 billion US dollars from $671 million. Likewise, reinvestment of earnings improved by 5.4% to $225 million from $213 million comparable year ago level. On research and development, the authors may want to note that the Philippines has a strong legal and institutional framework. Among others, we have the Philippine Innovation Act, Philippine Startup Act, Technology Transfer Act, and a comprehensive IP regime. To complement the implementation of the Innovative Startup Act, which was enacted in 2019, the DTI has established regional inclusive innovation centers in four pilot regions, namely the Gaspi in Region 5, Cebu in Region 7, Cagayan de Oro in Region 10, and Dabao in Region 11. In addition, there are currently 100 innovation technology support offices 
or technology innovation support centers located in various state universities and research institutions which support the research and development activities in the country. On IPR, the authors may want to note that according to the 2021 Global Innovation Index, Philippines ranks 51st out of 132 other economies. Despite going down a notch in the ranking, the country remained on the list of five nations that made significant progress in innovation performance over time, together with China, Turkey, Vietnam, and India. The Philippines ranked fourth among 34 lower middle-income group economies and 11 among the 17 economies in Southeast Asia, East Asia, and Oceania. On e-commerce, the Philippines has seen 12 million new digital consumers since the start of the pandemic, of which 63% are from non-metro areas and 99% say that they intend to continue using these services going forward. Overall, the Philippines was the fastest growing market in the region, driven by strict lockdowns as well as tipping point on the adoption of certain digital services. The Philippines 2021 gross merchandise value is expected to reach a total value of 17 billion US dollars, a notable 93% year on year service. This tip increase is underpinned by 132% growth in e commerce. Looking at 2025, the overall internet economy will likely reach 40 billion US dollars in value. On energy, the authors may want to note that the target of ASEA is to increase the component of renewable energy to 23% by 2025, consistent with the endorsed ASEAN Plan of Action for Energy Cooperation Strategy. On mineral sector, according to the DNR Mines and Geosciences Bureau, the country's nickel industry remained resilient despite the pandemic with a reported increase of 4% in production and a 22% rise in export value in 2020. The value of the nickel industry's direct shipping ore was 38.86 billion pesos in 2020 against the year earlier, which is at 31.79 million pesos. I hope that the information and updates I shared to you this afternoon would be relevant in assessing the country's performance as we work towards the realization of APC Blueprint 2025. Again, thank you very much for all your support. And thank you very much, Asset uh, uh, Gepti, for taking the time to participate in our webinar by sending us your, your comments. Uh, very comprehensive uh, remarks on uh, the various strategies, both domestic and uh, those undertaken at the regional level, to help uh, the different member states, including uh, the Philippines, meet uh, the uh, goals of the AEC uh, vision, AEC ASEAN. Uh, Economic Community Division 2025. If you have questions or uh, if you have, um, if you want to request uh, for clarifications regarding Asset Kept this uh, presentation, just type it in our chat box. We will collect all the questions and send these to his office. And, and uh, once we have the answers, we will email this to all participants or uh, we may also upload uh, their response on our website or, or on our Facebook page. Okay. So our second discussion comes from um, the main organization uh, which handles ASEAN-related matters, and we are honored to have with us uh, Ms. Glenda Reyes, Assistant Director of the Monitoring, Surveillance, and Coordination Division of the ASEAN Integration Monitoring Directory. She undertakes and coordinates the monitoring of ASEAN initiatives on regional economic integration. Uh, she also handled various uh, portfolios from 2005 to 2014 in several divisions of the AEC Department of the ASEAN Secretariat. She will join um, the Secretariat in June 2020 after completing her graduate studies in public policy at the National College of Public Administration and Governance of the University of the Philippines. Prior to her return to the ASEAN Secretariat, she worked as an independent consultant in the areas of regional integration, free trade agreement, trade in services and investment. Director Reyes, you now, you now have the virtual floor. Um, thank you, Sheila. A pleasant good afternoon to all. Uh, thank you for inviting us to be a discussant in this webinar and the study how does the Philippines fare in meeting as an economic community vision 2025. 
We welcome the opportunity to contribute to this discussion. This is indeed a remarkable timing because this year, as some of you would, as some of you may be aware, ASEAN has also completed the midterm review of the AEC Group in 2025. It assessed the progress and outcomes and impacts of the implementation of the AEC strategic measures from 2016 to 2020. In a manner of speaking, the MTR report has served as a report card or scorecard in the first phase of the blueprint's implementation, but more than this, it has served as an important and critical resource to improve the implementation of the blueprint onwards and help ensure that ASEAN delivers its AEC targets and goals by 2025. From the MTR report, ASEAN and the AEC sectoral bodies, as well as member states, can draw lessons from moving forward to address existing gaps and challenges that confront the region's economic integration sector. We note the convergence of the purpose between the MTR and the study. A key objective of the study, as we understand, is to come up with policy recommendations that would address the gaps in socioeconomic planning and implementation process that have hindered the Philippines from achieving specific EEC goals. In the context of the EEC, the study could assist the Philippines address its internal bottlenecks that constrain maximization of gains from its participation in the region's economic integration process. We welcome the study's use of the AEC indicators to, gut, to gauge the Philippine performance. As outcome-based indicators, this measure the extent by which policies and program initiatives have yielded the results aimed for. A positive trajectory or increase in trend for these indicators would be most welcome as it means that government policies and programs are working and yielding positive results, and by extension, also benefiting ASEAN as a whole. The study's approach of ranking Philippine performance relative to the other member states can help, one, identify that areas that can be further improved, and two, show the potential or what can be further achieved. It would be beneficial to view this from the perspective of policy learning how Philippines can learn from the experience of other countries and use this to adapt and reform the areas where it is lagging or performing fairly or poorly. At this point, allow me to share some key points of the MTR report where the study could perhaps draw some insights from in terms of rec recommendations for the Philippines and future research work of the IDS. The MTR highlights, one, the need to expedite implementation of action lines or measures that have long been delayed or to help fast track the region's recovery from the pandemic and build the foundation for long-term resilience. The pandemic has given us the window for reflection and the call for everyone, all member states, to build back better. This means that reforms that have long been delayed should be prioritized and undertaken with resolve. Two, AEC must intensify implementation of high-impact measures, which calls attention to the quality of measures. Focus should be on initiatives or measures that really yield desired outcomes. While we still monitor the completion rates or how, how many percent have been accomplished over the years for its own merit, this is not the sole focus and objective of the AEC m &E system. Three, it calls for an elevated level of commitment from all member states. Apart from implementing their obligations and commitments in various economic agreements, including free trade agreements, member states should commit and implement measures that match and can deliver the, the desired characteristics of AEC by 2025. You've already heard the five characteristics uh, earlier in the presentations, and these are the characteristics that we desire to have by 2025. Three, ensure the synergy of measures underlining the interconnected and interdependence of work across sectors. This calls for strengthened coordination in planning, policy making, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation. It emphasizes that the challenges that we are currently facing require a more integrated and holistic approach. Its simple message is to do away with the silo mentality and really implement the whole of government approach or a systems approach. Four, a coordinated approach is necessary to enhance the region's participation in the global value chain. The key to enhancing participation in GBC successful implementation of the related elements under the different characteristics of the AEC blueprint. Thus, beyond trade facilitation, we should also pay attention on improving competitiveness, ensuring competitive services industry, attracting productivity, boosting investment, promoting innovation, developing human capital, and building local ancillary industries. Five, there is a need to mainstream good regulatory practice. 
as noted in the MTR report, regulatory burden and lack of regulatory coherence are major obstacles in a wide range of AEC initiatives. Six, adapting to new developments. For ASEAN to be agile, flexible, creative, and open to new ideas and conversations, this calls for ASEAN to be proactive, to seize new opportunities, and address emerging issues and challenges. The MTR process itself has valuable lessons to share. First, the recommendations of the MTR dealt with both operational and strategic issues. The former look at the implementation bottlenecks, while the latter assess the medium and long-term implications of new developments and emerging trends. If I may also mention, an important analytical component of the MTR was a strategic assessment of the global and regional landscapes. Second, the MTR recommendations have been concretized. Specific concrete measures, or what is called actionables, accompany the recommendations. This is to make sure that the recommendations are implementable on the ground. Third, as part of the m and &E strengthening process and ensuring the MTR results are not lost in vain, ASEAN AEC is also tracking the follow-up work on the MTR recommendations on how the AEC relevant bodies or sectoral bodies are considering and implementing these proposed solutions. PITS and the authors may view this as areas for a furthering the study, even beyond the scope of its current TFR. If I may venture further, the work that has been initiated through this study is in the right direction to initiate a national barometer and stage the ground for setting a more regular monitoring and assessment of faithful performance and progress vis-a-vis -vis AEC commitments and how it is benefiting from its participation and engagement in the AEC. Let me also touch upon a question that you might have since I mentioned that ASEAN has to be proactive. And this is related to the matter of how ASEAN, how has ASEAN and AEC in particular, dealt with the mega trends and emerging issues and challenges, particularly the pandemic. I also understand that this is partly covered in the study's recommendation on the need to update the AEC Vision 2025 on this account. One of the critical challenges that struck the globe recently is the COVID-19 pandemic, and we all know that what its impact has been on the global economy, to the region and our economies, as we are still all reeling from its effects. To address this, ASEAN has come up with a complementary document in 2020, and this was actually referred to already by, under, uh, by Assistant Secretary Alan Gepti. This document, complementary document, is the ASEAN Comprehensive Recovery Framework, or ACRF, which is actually ASEAN's exit strategy from the pandemic. It follows a three-phase approach for ASEAN to transition from the new normal and build a more resilient future, from the transition to the new normal, um, from the pandemic to the opening to recovery to resilience. It spouse five broad strategies, enhancing health systems, strengthening the human security, maximizing the potential of intra-ASEAN market and broader economic integration, which is actually what is uh, mainly covered in the AEC blueprint, accelerating inclusive digital transformation, which is part of uh, characteristic BNC, advancing towards a more sustainable and resilient future. The recovery framework is accompanied by an implementation plan that covers initiatives from all ASEAN to mid-Italy large. But a large number of these are AEC initiatives, which include measures that have been priori prioritized and accelerated. A concrete example that I can give, and this is actually already mentioned also by uh, Assistant Hefti, is on how ASEAN, for instance, is addressing the non-tariff measure under this environment. Given the impact of the pandemic, ASEAN has accelerated the implementation of trade facilitation measure through the issuance of the MOU between member states on essential goods to ensure that the non-tariff measures that do not serve, the non-tariff measures do not serve as barriers or additional burden in the flow or supply of these essential goods in the region. And recently, the ASEAN further initiated the expansion of the lease of essential goods that would be covered by this MOU. The work on the AEC blueprint is actually undertaken by various sectoral bodies. The strategic measures in the blueprint are implemented through the sector's work plans. With the recent development, some sectors have already updated or calibrated their sectoral work plans. For others, especially those that follow the five-year cycle, the recently issued sectoral work plans for 2021 to 2025 have considered these emerging issues and challenges and factor this in the regional sector of cooperation initiatives for the second phase of the AEC. On this note, 
let me thank the ideas for this opportunity and congratulate the authors for this study. I hope that these uh, remarks and intervention um, has been can contribute in furthering the uh, discussion paper and also in um, the future uh, research work or undertaking of the PID, of PID, PIDS. On this note, maraming salamat po ulit at magandang hap. Maraming salamat din, uh, Assistant Director Glenda Reyes of the ASEAN Secretariat. So uh, we'll have uh, more time to listen to um, Director Reyes uh, during the open forum. So before we start entertaining questions, um, let me um, let me uh, tell all of you that we won't have a poll today, okay? But we will give a prize to the three WebEx participants who who were the first to send their questions on our chat box. Questions about the presentations or questions related to the topic of the webinar and not on how to access the presentation. Okay, I, I'd like to be clear on that, okay? And to show our gratitude to our Facebook viewers, we'll also give a prize to the first two viewers on Facebook who asked a question. Okay, I will announce the names of the five winners after the open forum. Okay, so let us now proceed to the open forum. So I invite uh, Dr. Kimba and Dr. Uh, and Director Reyes. Okay, so, and as I have mentioned earlier, we will collate all the questions for ASEP Gepti and send, send these to his office and we'll let everyone know of, um, We'll let everyone know of uh, the response of DPI, either by uploading uh, their response on our website or emailing the answers to um, the to all of you. Okay. So we have some questions, some interesting questions here. Let me let me start uh, with the question of Chris Chris Joy Quintanar, and this is for you, Francis. He, uh, he wants to know under what AEC. Characteristic does legal services fall? And uh, she, uh, she said, I have read that one of the country's commitments is to liberalize our legal services, and I'd like to see how we're doing so far on that. Okay, Francis. Francis, uh, please turn uh, on. on mute. Yes. Am I on mute? You're okay now. Okay. So yes, uh, first let me thank uh, our discussants, no? so uh, ASEC Gepti and uh, Assistant Director uh, Glenda Reyes for our for um, uh, providing very useful comments and inputs, especially in terms of uh, areas for further research and to further improve the discussion in, in the paper, especially because um, a lot of the discussions were written even before the, we've really seen the, the major impacts to the economy of, of the COVID-19 restrictions. So these are actually very helpful to um, recalibrate and to rethink uh, some of the, the indicators and even some of our policy recommendations. So again, these are um, most welcome and thank you very much for, for um, sharing us with us your, uh, the information and your time. Okay, so now I am um, to go back to the question. Yes, uh, the it is falling under um, characteristic one, highly integrated and cohesive uh, economy. Uh, uh, this is a one of the indicators. There would be the share of services sector in GDP, which is um, how much is your services value added as a percentage of GDP? And uh, yes, as um, data from the PSA has shown that the Philippines, uh, a large part of the Philippine GDP is um, uh, services has actually a large share of that. And um, we rank actually very high here. We're actually in among the top one, one to the three, uh, first to the third uh, among the ASEAN uh, economies in, in this sector. And uh, the the trend is actually we're we're on track. We're um, uh, moving towards the the direction of of what is in mentioned in the goal and the AEC. But that is actually looking at um, uh, you know the the share of uh, your services to to the Philippine GDP and not looking at the liberalization because as as you know. Um, uh, liberalizing services in the Philippines is actually um, a, a touchy um, matter because of, of um, it's only if there's um, if it's uh, it it can be uh, 
in 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 the in our agreements if it's um something that uh, other countries will also liberalize in return for liberalizing uh, legal services so if there's a quid pro quo type so that's the only time that uh, that would be uh, liberalized so we're doing very well and well to answer your question we're doing very well in terms of the high level of services in in the country um legal services maybe uh, is part of that but uh, there are other services that's actually part of that so it's not just legal services but liberalizing services in the country is a little bit uh, difficult so there are still a number of services sectors that are not yet liberalized in, in the Philippines. so that's the, the answer to, to that question thank you very much francis now let me jump to a question from uh, Fernando Mendoza. Are the panelists aware of any multilateral agreements on anti-corruption or integrity mechanisms across the uh, across the region? Um, I'll I'll go to uh, Director Glenda after you, Francis. Okay. Yes. Um, hi, yes. Uh, Chief. Yes. I, I have to check uh, because uh, these matters would actually be covered by the other ASEAN community pillars. Um, in, in this discussion, I represent the ASEAN economic community yes. pillar. So yes. that particular question, uh, I'm sorry that I cannot give a definitive response on whether we have, but it's actually worth checking. Uh, and I can probably get back to you a bit later and check. No problem. Questions. No problem, uh, Glenda. Okay. A question from Thomas uh, Benjamin Marcelo. How does the Philippines fare relative to other ASEAN trade partners in uh, utilizing the tariff concessions under the various FTAs, either among AMS and between AMS and dialogue partners? What efforts are being implemented to further maximize Philippine use of the tariff concessions? Um, Francis, you may uh, want to take a crack on this uh, since you have done studies on uh, our FTAs. Yes, uh, thank you. And uh, thank you very much to uh, um, Thomas Marcelo for, uh, I think, yeah. But, okay, so let, okay. I'm actually trying to look for a study, but maybe I'll, I'll just post the, the link of the paper here in the, in the chat box because oh, I'm nice. trying to, to access uh, a paper that we have written with, um, that I've written together with uh, a number of colleagues from the ASEAN. Um, headed by also uh, Kazunobu Hayakawa. So it's actually a, a published work that's, uh, well, very recently published. And it's, um, the title is uh, Determinants of Regional Trade Agreement Utilization, um, mm -hmm. Evidence from Multiple Imports in, Import Countries in Asia. So it's actually a cross-country study and it's written uh, together with colleagues from, uh, Japan, Thailand, Indonesia, um, Korea, and Singapore. So th there's actually a number of, uh, and also the Philippines. So there's also a number of authors uh, from that because we've um, tried to collate as much information as we can. So I, I can't remember exactly the, the, the status for the Philippines, but what I remember is that um, for, there are some uh, trade partners where we actually have high utilization rates. If I remember correctly, I think it's uh, Australia, New Zealand, there's high utilization of imports. So let me um, clarify that we're talking about importers. So importers trying to bring in um, goods from Australia and New Zealand are, are utilizing the zero tariff from um, given by the, the FTAs. No? But uh, but there are some that's uh, a little bit uh, still low and that can still be further improved. I think uh, Pichepa, I think, is one of those uh, um, agreements. And uh, I, I think even ASEAN has, has room for improvement. No? So, and how can we do this? I think really one one way of uh, improving is really, um, I think DTI has uh, has always been doing this, you know, to, to really um, uh, provide information on how to utilize the, the trade agreements, especially for our importers to, to as much as possible, encourage them to utilize and uh, provide uh, knowledge and information. Um, I have an anecdote that I will share very quickly in one of our um, key informant uh, interviews. One um, respondent mentioned that 
we actually look at the knowledge of how to use our trade agreements for importation as their um, com competitive advantage against their competitors because some of their competitors don't know how to use the the trade agreements don't know how to import using the ROO, the rules of origin. And well, on the one hand, I, I would support them that at least they know how to use it. But on the other hand, I was really think, hoping that they would share the information across all the other importers so that, you know, our, our um, uh, trade agreements would actually have um, more utilization or higher utilization. So, um, Maybe just to to summarize, you no. Know, so the the one of the real main effort should be to really uh, have a hand holding session on to our MSMEs on how to uh, import and utilize our trade agreements. Thank you. And thank you very much, Francis. Uh, we have another uh, question here. It's it's from uh, Julius Perez uh, Relampagos of the University of San Carlos. Yeah, you know him, Francis, do you? <laughs> okay. Uh, let me read the question. ASEAN uh, countries are individually passing data privacy legislation or frameworks to protect consumers in a digital environment, but the proliferation of frameworks also present its own challenges, True. such as the uncertainty that occurs when frameworks conflict with each other when they are not harmonized. Okay. Would harmonization of data privacy laws within the ASEAN be a policy in the right direction? And any thoughts on un the unintended effects of such harmonization? Um, Francis, please. And no, I, okay. I may... okay, let me try to um, piece together my, uh, a number of results from our different research. Because uh, I think uh, Silwin, uh, my... my a very able uh, research assistant and together with me and um, we just uh, completed an, a study with the UNSCAP uh, related to yeah. our integration uh, how ready are we with uh, digital trade integration and I think that's very much uh, related to what uh, um, what well, what was asked no so it was talking about data privacy and uh, you know the import data privacy is equally important when we're talking about digital trade because um if, if it's just a domestic policy of digital policy then it it really wouldn't have any effect with our um particip our our linkages with other countries but if if it it matters more when we're uh, looking at uh, digital trade digital trade integration digital trade participation so that's so having a harmonized system would have some would have benefits, and we've we've learned and we've seen that especially in a number of um, circumstances. So it's not just in terms of digi uh, in terms of um, uh, digital privacy frameworks, no. But you know, for example, in terms of ROOs, uh, in terms of RCEP, uh, the the often discussed a spaghetti bowl or noodle bowl effect when rules of origin have really become so confusing with all these uh, ASEAN plus ones, with all these diff different frameworks. And having a unified system uh, through RCEP would actually help in increasing and removing all this confusion. And that's also the same direction that we're trying to pursue if we're going to have a unified uh, policy on, on data privacy. Uh, and uh, I think that that's that, that's one thing. And the, another thing that unintended con consequence I think would be some in terms of benefits. You no, know? having an ASEAN uh, system, uh, something that uh, all the ten countries have agreed to, can would give us clout in order to ask, uh, in order to persuade other countries to follow our system to try to come up with uh, their data policy um, aligned with our system if they want to trade with us as a big big block as a, a, a big uh, trading block so for in and this time it would be related to our uh, digital trade so so i think that's that's uh, a good uh, policy direction for 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 us and for the, the asean as a whole mm -hmm. um francis is this something that is being pursued under the rsf I think it's one one thing that's um, let me let me confirm though. But I I know that uh, there's an e-commerce chap chapter in RCEP, and I'm not sure how um, the privacy rules are incorporated in that. 
Thank you very much, Francis. Uh, Director Glenda, you may want to uh, um, add to uh, what Francis mentioned, your, your own take on this. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'll just give a general response. Um, I guess uh, the question of harmonization, whether it's good or what are the, you know, the pros and cons of this. I think as a general response, in, in any undertaking or in any venture, uh, especially if it will require um, commitment mm -hmm. from member states, the very first thing that we need to do is actually undertake a critical study of what will be the implication and what will be the requirements for such undertaking. Uh, because for one, we have to also know that the ASEAN is composed of 10, 10 member states ten and member states. Have 10 member states and we have uh, different levels of developments, different levels of maturity, different legal systems, different infrastructure, and all of this would have to be taken into consideration um, in, in even thinking of how we would be harmonizing or where we would be uh, proceeding or how we would be proceeding in order to achieve some form of convergence. I guess that would, would be my, my response uh, to that uh, question because Category, I mean, we cannot categorically say that it is harmful or it is bad or it is not good because I think there are plus and uh, plus and minus points on this. On the minus points, I think what needs to be done is to look at how we can actually strengthen. For example, there are certain countries where there are certain limitations or constraints to be able to, 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 to meet, you know, the convergence points among the member countries. And that would require some some kind of um, support in terms of policy and programs. So I, I guess I, I would have to respond in, in that manner because I think uh, the purpose of our work in ASEAN is actually to achieve some form or some level of economic integration. And I think digital integration will be a key component in the future, especially in this time of age where it's not just, uh, we're not just in the digital era, but we're moving towards for industrial revolution. I, I, I would um, 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 agree, well, not agree, I would point out that there are actually security issues also in that regard. And that is actually a, a, a matter that would have to be seriously looked into also, not just from the economic perspective, but also from the security perspective. So all of this would have to be taken into consideration. Thank you very much, uh, Director Glenda. So, okay, we don't have questions anymore from our web expert participants. So, okay, let me give you some time to think of other questions. So, um, Director Glenda, I I um I had a chance to browse the MTR, the midterm review. The one that's uh, publicly accessible on on uh, the ASEAN secret, um, the ASEAN uh, secretariat uh, website, and I, I noticed that in terms of overall compliance, no, it's only fifty four overall status of compliance across the uh, ASEAN member states. It's only fifty four point one percent, if I am not mistaken. It's uh yeah, it didn't even reach sixty percent, I know. So um. Since you're working at, uh, you know, the regional level sa ASEAN Secretariat, what are the general issues that you see across the member states, no? In uh, in terms of, you know, bottlenecks to meeting the the the, the blueprint, to meeting the um, key result areas in the blueprint? Okay. Um, the MTR actually looked at the sectoral work plans. So basically, uh, Francis uh, discussed about the elements of the AEC blueprint. And as I've said earlier, these are implemented through uh, the various sectoral work plans, 23 plus sectoral work plans. And plus. we look at around 1,700 um, action lines. It's actually a lot from 2016 to 2020, uh, 20, 2025. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but um, I think you are referring to the completion rate. Because yeah, we completion rate. Completion rate. Okay, because we're actually looking at, uh, in terms of the implementation okay, rate, basically, we categorize it in terms of um, 
how many percent have actually been completed, how many mm -hmm. are ongoing, and how many are are for further for, for, for implementation. So when we talk of the implementation rate, we actually captured both both those that have been completed and those that are ongoing. Now, when we refer to the, the completion rate, this means that uh, we are measuring those outputs that have all been promised to be delivered at the regional and national level. So I think it's um, 55% or about 60%. I, I can't exactly recall the figure, but it's more than 50%. Uh, it's a fair enough, um, it's a good enough number. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a good enough number in terms of what we've completed so far since we are since we have implemented yeah. the first phase the first yeah. phase of implementation. anyway midterm naman ano, we still have five more years <laughs> five more years to go uh, but in terms of uh where we see some difficulties this is a general response again uh mm -hmm. because you have to understand that in terms of the um aec measures okay these are the intention is actually to create an enabling environment for ASEAN, and these are in the form of agreements, policy agreements uh, that are embedded in the economic agreements and economic instruments. And what needs to be done by member states or countries uh, who are part of the ASEAN is actually to implement these agreements at the national level. So the question is to what extent these economic instruments or policy principles or policy policy guidelines are, are being adopted at the national level. Uh, the critical point is to what extent these are actually cascaded and being transposed mm -hmm. at the national level. Mm -hmm. So let me uh, relate that to the earlier question on, uh, I think, legal services. I think legal there was a question services, on legal services yes. and how we are doing. And um, I, I support uh, Francis' uh, uh, observation earlier that while we are talking of uh, openness, market openness in, in the region, we are talking of uh, liberalization. Mm -hmm. uh, the Philippines is actually one of the uh, countries which is having great difficulty in this regard, particularly in trade and services, because a number of our um, a number of our um, uh, economic risk restrictions are actually in in, in the constitution. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm not just so sure about legal services, but before anything can actually be liberalized, you know, we have to look at the existing uh, regulations in the constitution. What are the legal restrictions? Uh, what are the, the 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 legal restrictions in our RAs and our executive orders? And to what extent can we actually commit? In as far as the ASEAN uh, framework agreement or services. Uh, is concerned, okay, while we call for um, trade in services liberalization, most of the items that have actually been committed by countries, especially the Philippines, are within the bounds of what is allowable in its regulation. Uh, I'm not this, uh, I'm, I'm not, uh, if you, if you, if you uh, remember uh, direct, uh, Assistant Secretary Hepti's intervention, there are a number of areas that call for liberalization that are pending in Congress. Uh, it is only during this time when we are able to pass a law in Congress and we actually commit this in ASEAN that we can say that we have actually liberalized. Uh, because at this juncture, most of the commitments of the Philippines and APAS are actually just within the bounds of what is prescribed by by our law in the Philippines. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for that, uh, Director Glenda. Um, Francis, would you have anything to say or would you have anything to add? Uh, yes. Um, so I'm actually checking the, the foreign investment negative list of the Philippines, which uh, identifies where uh, uh, foreign ownership is limited. No? And um, uh, practice of professions, there's actually no uh, no foreign equity allowed, and this is enshrined in the constitution. So, yeah, as as uh, Director Glenda has said, no, but I think there's um, there's some yeah a footnote here that says that um, it's um, if there's some reciprocity. I think if I remember correctly, you no. Know, so if it's uh, some some level of reciprocity where the um, 
then there it may be it may be uh, liberalized so are uh, yeah so foreigners are allowed to practice in the philippines subject to reciprocity so if you're allowed to pro to um, uh, practice in their country then you would be allowed to um, practice here but uh, yeah but yeah that so the the real uh, restriction here are really the some of the economic restrictions that are enshrined in our constitution and that's the one that's we're having difficulty in um, loosening because of the the because of the in it's a, in the constitution so it's a difficult thing a difficult process to initiate thank you thank you very much francis okay um okay we have another question here oh uh, okay this is a con this is a comment of oh, Chris Joy Quintanar just said, the PH has not yet made concrete steps on liberalizing its legal services until now. And you are correct that the initiative should come from the Congress as this goes, as this goes so far to amending our constitution. Here's to hoping we do realize it soon. Thank you, uh, Krisha, for that. Okay, so at this point, uh, I think we have already covered uh, um, all the questions from our uh, Webex and uh, Facebook uh, participants. So just to cap our discussion, may I, may I ask uh, both of you uh, for your uh, brief final remarks? Um, uh, Francis, you first, and then we'll go to Director Gilenda. Uh, okay, so uh, I think one of the real um, main um, thrusts of uh, digit of trade and um, regional integration is that it's it's actually both a tool for economic development and aside from uh, from the goal of uh, being integrated and uh, and forming a community. So one of the one of the things that the Philippines can really do is try to utilize what we have committed to the to the formation of the ASEAN community in 2025 to utilize those commitments and translate those to our domestic regulations and domestic policies because uh, we we would be more efficient doing things that way hitting two birds with one stone with by um meeting our international commitments and at the same time improving our domestic policies and uh, I I really support the Department of Trade and Industries initiatives in trying to meet all of as as many as they can no, in that's within their purview of uh, meeting the the commitments of the, the Philippines. So in terms of uh, different policies and programs, the IQPS recognizing that uh, innovation is is key to a lot of this and even promoting services. And then there's also that the sticking points, the areas where we're really have going having difficulty, as mentioned earlier. So so the areas where we have difficulty liberalizing are those that are really enshrined in the constitution. But um there are still other areas where we can uh, do better no? and I, I think um one of those is the the public service act no? it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's a very old law that needs to really to be amended and uh, um the, the 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 support for the amendment of this law is is uh, something that's uh, high among um, policy poly, um, policy uh, authors and policy uh, analysts um, so again, uh, the the idea is um, to use uh, our international commitments for domestic uh, improvements or for domestic uh, policies. Thank you. And thank you very much, uh, Dr. Francis Kimba, and um, Assistant Director um, Glenda Reyes. Hi. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Sheila. I guess I just have two points to uh, highlight. I already mentioned this in the remarks earlier on the paper on the discussion paper. But one thing that I would just like two two things that I would just like to highlight uh, is actually the the value of good regulatory practice. Um, I think um, most of the most of the constraints, most of the binding constraints of uh, any particular country, or in this case the Philippines, actually emanate from the fact that we have uh, in some cases antiquated uh, regulations and laws, and perhaps it's actually time to already revisit all these laws and see. Uh, whether these are still valid, given that we are already moving towards port industrial re revolution and things are dynamic and changing, things that we have enshrined in um, in the constitution and in some of our laws, 
um, are, are, are things that we need to revisit because it actually, uh, I guess speaking as an individual, uh, as a citizen of the Philippines, is these are areas which um, limit our capacity from participating not only in ASEAN, but also in other, in, in, in not only participating, but also in enjoying the benefits of our engagement in ASEAN, but also in our other FTA agreements. Uh, the second point, of course, is, and this is highlighted also in the MPR, the need for a more holistic syst systems approach. Uh, we have to realize that in order for us, for example, one of the things that was mentioned by the study, is for us to um, uh, improve on our intra asean trade. But before we can even, you know, that particular aspect would actually require a whole of government approach because it is not only about tariff reduction, it is also about removing non-tariff barriers. It is also about attracting investments. It is also about uh, encouraging uh, innovations and supporting science and technology research in these areas. So I, I would strongly urge um, um, what, what we actually call uh, a full of government approach and really implementing this full of government approach. I think most of the time we hear this being spoken of, but the question is how do we really implement this? Uh, what are the nuts and bolts to take to make this uh, uh, work for, for the country? Thank you. And thank you very much. Okay, so friends, please join me in thanking Dr. Francis Kimba and his uh, co-authors, also Assistant Director uh, Glenda Reyes of the ASEAN Secretary, and of course, um, Assistant uh, Secretary Alan Gepti of the DTI, who uh, sent us, he also sent us his comments. Please uh, uh, give all of them a big virtual clap, and thank you again for the insights, valuable insights that you shared with us this afternoon. Okay, and let me announce the, the uh, three attendees on WebEx um, who uh, asked uh, a question. Okay, and so as a token of our appreciation, we will send your, um, you have a prize from, uh, from PIDS. Christian Choi Quintanar, Thomas Benjamin Marcelo, and Fernando Mendoza. And from uh, Facebook, we have uh, Mr. Julius uh, Perez. Relampagos. Okay, so we will contact you. The webinar team will contact you for your price. Okay, so um, and finally, we have some reminders. Okay, so you can access uh, the presentation of Dr. Francis Kimba, um, as well as the uh, the full study from uh, the PIDS uh, website. Flash on the screen are uh, the links. Is the link to the full study and. Uh, also, the link to the seminar page where we, you can download the, uh, the presentation. And we will also upload there the, uh, the video presentation. I mean, the, the video uh, of uh, Dr. Of, um, Asikepti. Okay. And also, please help us improve our webinars by answering the feedback survey that will pop on your screen after, um, after this virtual event. We will email you the link. Um, and uh, please uh, send us your comments. Your, your comments are important to us to improve our virtual events. And please also regularly visit our website and social media pages. Again, thank you to all our Facebook participants and also those who tune in on our uh, Twitter account for the live, live updates of this event. And for our last webinar uh, for 2021, we have on December 8th, um, analyzing the president's budget for 2022. So we hope you'll join us again, okay, on December 9th. And uh, finally, we would like to thank all the um, agencies, all the organizations from uh, very from uh, various uh, government um, agencies, as well as those from uh, the academic, civil society, business, and international development community who join us today. So this concludes our webinar for this week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay informed too. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. See you next week.